Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Trident's Marketing Communications Manager, Daniel Sloan, and we're excited to be bringing you today's Culture of Research and Education webinar called Email Interviews and Qualitative Research, an Innovative Approach to Data Collection. The core webinar series is designed to provide faculty, students, and alumni an opportunity to share their research and scholarship with the Trident community. By fostering a culture of professional development and idea exchange, participants will have access to a valuable forum for lifelong learning. This university-wide effort is coordinated by Trident Doctoral Studies Directors. A few notes before we, we begin today's session and I introduce our presenters. You're welcome to ask questions at any time. You can do that by finding the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Go about halfway down, you'll see a questions box and you can type them in there. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Keep in mind that everyone is muted. So the, if you have a question, the best way to get that to us is to type that in the question box or you can email it to us as well. Uh, and my email is daniel.sloan at trident.edu if you prefer to go that way. Please do not use the raise the hand function because we, we are unable to communicate you with you that way. And just one other note, um, unfortunately, Dr. Deegan is unable to be present today, but she was nice enough to pre-record her portion of the presentation. There'll be two videos of the slides that she presents, which will play at a couple different parts during the presentation. When those videos are shown, please make sure that you use your computer for the audio rather than your phone. Otherwise, you'll not be able to hear Dr. Deegan. Uh, and, and keep in mind, there's a survey that's at the end. So if, you, if you're able to, please fill it out. That definitely helps us in planning content for the future. And this webinar will be recorded and we'll be sending a slide deck out to you uh, by early next week at the latest. So let's introduce our two presenters today. First, we have Dr. Cami Romanek Murphy. Uh, she's a prof uh, professor in the Masters and EDD programs in the College of Education at, at Trident. She holds an EDD in Educational Leadership from Trident, uh, MA in Education in P to 8 Educational Administration from Wayne State College, and an MS in Speech Language Pathology. Um, from Minnesota State University. She has eight years of experience serving students in K-12 and public schools as a speech-language pathologist and has served as a faculty member at Trident since 2019. Next, we have uh, Dr. D uh, the aforementioned Dr. Deegan. Uh, Dr. Deegan is a doctoral mentor in the College of Education. Uh, she, 10 years of experience in higher education, uh, writing and coaching, 20 years experience in general writing and coaching, holding an EDD from California State University, Long Beach. Uh, she uh, serves as a doctoral writing coach uh, uh, for in Trident's College of Education. So now I think we're about to get started. So let me hand the reins of the presentation off to Dr. Romanek Murphy. Thank you so much, Danny. Hi, everybody. Um, we're very, very excited that we had such a great turnout for this webinar. There are many of you tuning in to listen in all about email interviews, and I'm sure hoping by the end of this presentation you can walk away with a good understanding of what email interviews are, and you can take away some practical tips so you can get started with your qualitative research and getting some really great data with email interviews. So very briefly, let's talk about the learning objectives for today. So first, you should be able to describe when and how email interviews can be used as an effective data collection method for qualitative research. And then we'll be talking about the strengths and challenges of email interviews and how to combat some of those potential challenges. We'll then talk about best practices related to all things methodology, instrument development, informed consent, data collection, data analysis, all that good stuff. And then lastly, I hope that you find the handouts we've provided today to be useful resources for you so you can kind of have something in hand so you can go get started with your research right away. So we're gonna dig into all of that. And with that, we'll move on to our next slide. 
the purpose of this training is not about qualitative research as a whole. However, we wanted to provide just a little bit of background in case we have a lot of students who are just getting started on their research journey and need a little or need a little refresher. And so, as you probably know, quantitative research and qualitative research are not the same thing. They're different approaches. So quantitative research, it uses numbers and statistics to study more surface descriptions of larger samples of the population. And it allows you to test hypotheses using numbers and you can analyze your data this way as well. So qualitative research, we're really focused on getting to a deep understanding of a phenomenon or an idea by exploring our, our participants' perceptions, opinions, beliefs, and attitudes. So what we're really looking for is to explore the ideas and the voices of people that we work with and to really ascribe meaning to that. We want a deep, deep understanding when we use a qualitative approach. What is the meaning? Very briefly, in qualitative research, there are five major designs, but there are many more than this. So the primary designs are case study, ethnography, narrative, phenomenological, and grounded theory. And all of them have some component of interview, typically included with the data collection. And common methods for qualitative research are observation, document analysis, audio and visual samples, maybe looking at field notes, some journals, logs, and most importantly for today's training, interviews. So of all of the methods of data collection, interviews are perhaps the most popular form of data collection and the most powerful because what we really want is to explore the human experience of something, but how do we do that without talking to the people, right? Um, so today is about all things interviews, but particularly email interviews and how to interview using email. So we'll move on to the next slide where, where we're going to talk briefly about what our email interviews probably no surprise here they're interviews but they're conducted via email they're literally email interviews so just like face-to-face -face interviews um, researchers will provide participants with interview questions which seek to explore their opinion their perceptions their ideas and attitudes toward the topic or the research question so typically with email interviews you create a list of questions you send them to your participants, and then they have the opportunity to review those questions and send them back to you within an agreed upon time frame. So structure-wise, email interviews can be structured, semi-structured, or open-ended. I will say typically structured email interviews are the most common, and what that means is that you're sending the same set of interview questions to all of your participants. That being said, this depends completely on the scope of your study, and it can be particularly useful to maybe use semi-structured interviews as, or send different protocols to different stakeholder groups because maybe you want to look at slightly different experiences or perceptions toward the research topic. Open-ended questions, I don't have a lot of experience, I mean open-ended format of interviewing with email interviews, it's been done, but I don't have a lot of experience with that. If that were the case, uh, it would really have to be kind of back and forth in live time because open-ended means you're making questions up, essentially, on the spot based on your participants' responses. So we're not going to focus too heavily on that format, but just know that it is a possibility. Just like face-to-face -face interviews, um, we usually on our protocols, we can have closed-ended questions and open-ended questions. I will caution you though, just like with all interviews in qualitative research, there should be a focus on open-ended questions. That's where you really get to hear the stories of your participants. That's how you hear their perspective and get to the meat of the topic you're trying to explore. But closed-ended questions are helpful too. For example, with demographic data, how many years have you served in your current role would be an example of a closed-ended question. Email interviews are typically conducted one-on-one. -on -one, so that would mean that you're sending your interview questions directly to a participant and they're sending them directly back to you again within an agreed upon time frame. And usually email interviews are asynchronous. So that means they're not happening in real time. We're not all sitting in at the same time um, at a Zoom session or a go-to webinar session and interacting with each other in real time. Usually if you are collecting data, if you're the researcher, you're sending the questions, you're giving the participants time to respond and they're getting back to you. And being a Trident student or faculty member, you are very familiar with an asynchronous format. 
So think about the same type of thing when it comes to interviewing. And with that, we're gonna to move to the next slide. And Dr. Deegan, although we're very sad she can't be with us today, she has recorded some narrative for us. So please tune in. Hi, everyone. I hope you're enjoying this workshop on email interviews. And I, I know that Dr. Romanek Murphy has been providing great guidance for you. I just wanna say a couple of things that will hopefully uh, clue you into why I am so passionate about this topic. The thing I want you to focus on, there are a lot of conveniences, a lot of logistic, listical, li, 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 let's start that over. The thing I want you to focus on is email interviews as a data collection tool. There are a lot of other logistical things that, that make it a very um, uh, efficient tool and a great way to gather data, but the key is the kind of data that you'll gather. So when we look on this slide, and you'll all have the PowerPoint, so you can, you can review all of these. I won't go over all of them. But um, when you're doing a qualitative case study, you're going deep. You're asking people about personal things. You're often asking them to reflect. And the kind of data that they will give you depends on you creating an interview setting that is intimate, that is confidential, where they have trust built up. And what I'm going to tell you, I've been using these, this methodology long enough, and my, many of my students have used it, is that email interviews really help you achieve all of that. It helps you give long answers. There's no, there's no word limit. I've had a student get a 25-page long email interview back from a participant, right? It's asynchronous, so there's no interview time pressure, no appointment pressure, things of that sort. And it's the kind of setting where even though they don't know you, even though you've never met, you do establish a lot of trust. So the, ben the biggest benefit of the email interview is you are maximizing collecting that rich, thick data, which Dr. Cresswell uh, um, talks about in qualitative studies. And that's the, the, uh, the, the really the biggest benefit that I can talk about and why I'm so passionate about this method is the kind of data that you get. So if we move to the next slide, um, who knew a global pandemic was going to come up, right? Nobody knew, but yet there it was. And it perfectly aligned with the usage, the benefit, the efficiency, the confidentiality, and really the safety of using email interviews. Because we are at home, whether we could get to the site or not, it was safe uh, to do it from home, to do it remotely. And this can carry on even after pandemic. We don't know how long we're gonna be in this mode of, of really trying to maximize safety. Those of you doing anything on a school site, you know it's challenging to be on a school site to interview. So the email interview method focuses on that interaction between uh, the participant and the and the um, researcher in a way that they will trust you. They will give you good data. They can do it on their own time. They have maximum flexibility. They don't have to risk anybody's health. And it really has become, uh, I'm so glad we had it up and running and accessible to students before the pandemic hit because many studies had to be adapted to this methodology because you could no longer go to sites. Um, so if you look at the next slide, this is just a, a list of the benefits of email interviews. As I said, there are many. It's cost efficient. Your transcript is already conducted for you. You don't have to worry about interpreting what a participant said by, by listening to a recording or looking at your notes because they're telling you exactly what they said. They're typing it. It also, I think, really the, the, one of the big keys is it streamlines the interview process in that everything is now on the participants time their schedule how long they want to write how they want to approach it what kind of language they want to use if they put in links to to give you greater information they have all of that freedom they can tell you exactly what they want to tell you and if any of you have ever been interviewed whether it's for a job or maybe you've been kind enough to be a participant in somebody else's study think about that setting in that room in real time across from a stranger you have to immediately trust you have to immediately establish a rapport and an intimacy and a sense of confidentiality and then you also have to remember everything you want to tell them sometimes you can't even you blank on where you used to work well the best place i ever worked was mm, i can't remember the name of that district or the credentials that i have i can't remember them all so there's a lot in an interview setting that is hard to recall. You want to say it. And maybe you'll remember weeks later and send the researcher an email and update your interview. But for the most part, you are bounded by what you remember in the real time. You also have to be bounded by, is your phone ringing? Are you running out of time? Do you have to rush to an appointment? So in an email interview, you control it. The participant controls it. 
And I believe, I've seen in my students, they just get better data because everything is streamlined, everything is efficient, everything is aimed at the participant, and everything is really set up for you to succeed and get that rich, thick data. And the confidence that the, the uh, participant uh, has, has demonstrated in the email interviews that I've read have been extraordinary. They're nothing like data that I ever gathered in person. So that's why I'm really excited for you all to just think about this methodology and consider it. The next slide, uh, we're just gonna look at a couple of um, challenges of email interviews because it's not perfect in every situation. There are challenges to overcome whether or not we're in a pandemic, but I think we have some solutions. I think we have some approaches that can really ameliorate some of that. For example, you, you may get a, get a participant who is vague, who says yes, no, who doesn't take the opportunity to really reflect deeply and share all that data with you. It happens every once in a while. And then you, that's somebody you can go back to, just like you could at, any, at a regular e interview, and seek um, some clarification or seek some elaboration if they're willing to do it. But every once in a while that does happen. Hopefully it's not the entirety of your of your participant pool and you do get rich data from others. But we do have to be aware that sometimes there's unremarkable data, whether it's quant or qual, and you could get unremarkable data through email interviews. But the relationship that you develop with your participant hopefully will let you go back to them. Um, Sometimes it takes forever to get it back, right? Faculty, leaders, anybody involved in a district, school district or a university, um, what we've seen is they have schedules during which they don't like to look at their emails, like summer, like spring break, like Christmas break. And sometimes it can take a long time to get it back. But the good news is once a participant agrees to be in your email interview pool, you have a way to contact them directly. You don't have to go through the school, you don't have to go through the college or some other um, intermediary, you can contact them directly. And hopefully that's a way that you can remind them, send, send them the informed consent and the interview protocol again, so that if they choose to participate, you can, you can keep them included. Um, there's definitely a digital divide here. Not everybody has email, not everybody can use email, not everybody has the internet. Um, if you're talking about young people, they're not gonna be answering email interviews anytime soon. They're not even opening their emails. So that's a challenge. But what I would say is take everything that's great about email interviews and adapt it to the modality that works for your community. Maybe they're on a listserv, maybe they're on Clubhouse, maybe which I'm learning a little bit about. Maybe they're on TikTok, I don't know. But you can establish the same kind of thing, a sense of confidentiality, a sense of trust and rapport, an open window in which they can express themselves with an unlimited amount of, of data and storytelling. And just really that, that environment that's as deep an exchange as possible can be done across other technologies. I've done it in Facebook um, and some other modalities. So even if there is a way where your participant can't, uh, uh, can't just jump on an email and be an email interview participant, be thoughtful about how else you can re reach them. Maybe it's a school district bulletin board. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of pressed to think of something that doesn't involve a computer, but we may have communities that, that need that flexibility. So that's something you can look at. Um, the other thing is about the, uh, the concerns of confidentiality. I know we said some, something about that earlier. We're gonna say more about it. When you walk into an interview, you're not anonymous. The interviewer knows who you are. They have your contact info, they have your name. You're not a total stranger off the street who will be unknown to them. So we're never seeking anonymity, we're seeking confidentiality. And I think your your informed consent is a key part of that to really tell the, um, tell the interviewee how careful you're gonna be about confidentiality and build that trust and, you know, certainly have have instruments that back that up and give them that comfort level. And it's just a conversation that you have to have. You may have to have two or three email exchanges before you get somebody to agree because of their concern about confidentiality. But the great news is no one else at the site, no one else at the college, no one else at the organization need ever know that they participated. And my dissertations for my students are always full of redactions. We redact everything we need to redact to, to really emphasize that confidentiality. Sometimes the state, sometimes the region, sometimes the, the foreign nation, we redact many, many things. So I think you really can give your uh, participant a sense of confidentiality. So the next slide, we have a few examples, and I, I'm going to read one later on. But for for this for this exercise, I really encourage you to look at the PowerPoint and read 
some of these excerpts. These are excerpts that were gathered through email interviews. And you can see the depth of the emotion. You can see, you know, they're talking about special needs students and how a teacher came to the rescue. Uh, my favorite memory was of, of Dan, my teacher. And you can see how they're talking about um, getting a team together, having inclusiveness and all of that. And I think the, the, when, you, when you recognize that this is coming from an individual who cared deeply and trusted enough to share this very, very deep data, you'll see the power of the methodology. And I hope you'll, you'll get as excited about it as I will. And I'm gonna come back in a few minutes with, um, with another bit of um, data that was gathered through email interviews. But thank you for your attention so far. Hi everybody, thank you so much for your patience as we swap back before between the pre-recording and myself. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna fast forward to a couple of examples of email interviews and the data that they can yield. And Dr. Deegan just did allude to the quote that we're gonna be talking about next. There was an example um, about a quote when a principal was asked to describe the, the benefits of special education, inclusive special education for students without disabilities. And the slides will catch up here um, soon, so please just bear with me. Um, I'll read the, I'm gonna read the quote to you while we wait. And I just want you to listen to this story and think about what you think about this question or this response. In one of our first grade classes, we had a new student start in January. This student has very unique needs and requires quite a bit of adult support throughout the school day. I'll call him Dan. Fast forward to May. The students in the same class were asked to share their favorite memory from first grade. Several of the students wrote about how their favorite memory was when jo Dan joined the class. They went on and on about how much they loved having Dan in their class. It was quite heartwarming to see that even our six-year-olds understand the power of and embrace inclusive learning environments. And this is a perfect example of the power of letting your participants reflect. A lot of the times you're asking participants things that they've never thought about before, right? They don't have necessarily a strong background on the topic. Perhaps they do, they can give you useful insight, but certainly sometimes they haven't thought specifically about the questions you're gonna ask. What are the chances that this principal would have told this very specific story with a very specific example when asked to describe inclusive education and the benefits for kiddos, for all students? for students with and without disabilities. I just thought this was beautifully written and it's all about hearing the voices of our participants. And this is a great example of how someone was to be able to consider the ref, um, question to reflect and then to put together a special, like a really special story with a beginning, a middle and an end and a solid purpose. So we're gonna move to the next slide. And again, I'm not gonna, or this time I'm not gonna read the quotes at all, but I would draw your attention to the very first quote. And in this study, uh, this is a higher ed faculty member discussing something that was very difficult for them, which was a decrease in relationships because of COVID. Uh, this particular study took place right in a March, April, when all of the schools first shut down. It certainly reading it brings me back to what that felt like. Things have changed a lot. They're still very devastating, but certainly that initial time of, of devastation and the fear and unknown, that, that was a time that was very um, pivotal for a lot of faculty members. And certainly this faculty member had shifted almost immediately overnight to telework. And they describe how much they missed their, their um, social relationships at work. And I think one of the other things I've seen with myself, I've done research with email interviews and also with the students that I oversee, is email interviews kind of afford the um, the ability, almost like journaling, for the reflective journaling. A lot of times when you have time to sit down with a pen and paper or your keyboard to just journal and reflect about things with or without a prompt, you won't believe the things that come out on paper. If you're asked about something you don't have any background on or have never had the chance to reflect upon, you might not be able to give that, these deep responses or have these deep, clear reflections. And lastly, one thing, especially about COVID that we talked about a little bit earlier, the responses from this higher ed faculty member, as well as any other studies that were being taken during that time and even now, is that a lot of these people that you're gonna be interviewing for your studies, they're busy, right? They're professionals. And if they're teleworking right now, they could also be juggling kids, 
They could be juggling home responsibilities and who knows what else. They're caregiving to other people that they love, going through job loss, all sorts of different things. And so it is very important to give them as much flexibility as they can and to be respectful of their time. And with email interviews, you do let people kind of whittle away at responses when they have time, when they're not trying to virtual give a quality virtual education to their kids or, or watch their two and a half year old <laughs> while working. I speak from personal experience on that. Hi, it's Dr. Deegan again. I, this is a, the result of an email interview, one, one piece of data that I felt it was really important to share with you because it's so emblematic of the kind of data that we can gather through these email interviews. One of the things I want to think, think about, you know, I do quantitative research. I am a, a consumer and really a, a deep user of statistical analysis. Anyone who works in, in any form of research, you always have to have that understanding to make your case. But what I privilege uh, qual research about is it tells stories, it shows emotion. And these are the kind of things that I think have such a great opportunity to influence policy. So this is a, a bit of data from one of my students who was researching military students and how they are supported. You may not know if you're not affiliated with the military. Sometimes the, the children of active duty or reservists are educated on a base, at a base school, and sometimes they're in a local school district. Um, either near the base or, or somewhere else. And when the parent or both parents sometimes are deployed, that student then has to go live with a relative or live with grandma or, or live with friends or whatever. And um, oftentimes at the, at the local school district, not the base school, but at the local school district, people may not know that they are a military student. They may not know that their parents are deployed. They may not know anything that they're going through. And this is a group, I feel it's part of our, our, our bond with our military service members that we owe it to them to care for their children, especially in an educational setting while they're deployed. So this is a, this is a topic that was very close to my student's heart. She's a military wife. Her husband is career military. Her children, therefore, were military students who grew up with a parent deployed multiple times. And to top it off, she teaches on a base school. So she lives this very, very deeply. And she was really concerned about support for these students. So I just want to honor these words and read it, read it for you so you can hear it. This is what one of her participants said, who was a teacher. One memory that always struck me was when I was a first year teacher and was in the middle of an ELA class when I saw one of the chaplain honor God cars pull up in front of our school. I could see the visitor loop from my room. The war on terror was still relatively new and we had large amounts of families being deployed. As soon as I saw the cars, I knew something was wrong. Getting a little choked up. And that one of my babies was going to get bad news. I then saw the mom of one of my sweet girls step out of her car and walk in. Shortly after, I was asked to bring this little girl down. To down. I had to hold her while she was told her daddy had been killed in the war. I can still remember her little body sobbing. It's a sadness that will never go away for her. For her. Her mom was so strong and the chaplain was so calm, it broke my heart. My cousin was deployed at the time and it was a fear that we had. But again, you can't live in fear. Easier to say for an adult than a nine-year-old. It was a lesson to me that, that what goes on inside our classrooms is important, but these babies are facing so much more than just learning to read, reading to learn, and the three R's. So I want you to take that in and think about that kind of data being presented to policymakers whether it's a principal, whether it's a superintendent, whether it's a state legislature, people who are gonna make policy, who are gonna bring resources to a school to address such an urgent problem. That makes a case better than I could ever say, better than any chart or graph or statistics could ever say. And it's so impactful. And these are the kinds of things, the richness of data that you can get from email interviews. So I, I really hope you'll all consider it if it fits your study, if it fits your topic. And uh, I have no doubt that you'll all be able to gather uh, data of, of just as significant impact as the student. We're gonna move on. Um, I think you full well understand some of the benefits that go along with that. But let's move on to the next slide, which is best practices. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about this slide because we've included a handout. Please print these handouts or store them on your desktop, whatever works best for you. Um, so we're going to move to the next slide, which talks about best practices, frequently asked questions. 
These questions and more can be found on the handout, which you should be able to find at the bottom of the presentation and print off. I think they'll be sent out later too. We'll have to ask Danny. Um, but there are no huge, huge surprises when it comes to your methodology or data collection, data analysis. There are some intricacies that are a little bit different and some practical tips that are provided on the handout, but the methodology and all the, um, the decisions you make for data collection and so on and so forth, they're not so unlike face-to-face -face interviews. So please refer to the, that handout, take a look at it. We're gonna have a lot of time at the end of this presentation for questions, thankfully. And also Dr. Deegan and I are more than happy to speak with you via email, schedule a Zoom call with you, whether you're a student or a chair or just want some more information. We're so happy to go over any questions that you have in terms of best practices and tips. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the next slide, which talks about our last learning objective. We really want you to walk away from this presentation feeling like you've got a firm grasp on email interviews, what they are, how you can use them, and how you can get started. So if you're sitting down to start your IRB approval, um, well, I'm having a, a brain fart, as they say, but um, your application, your IRB application, and you're working through your methodology, we want you to be able to have resources to set you up for success, that you can say, okay, I'm choosing email interviews, if that's what's most appropriate for you, and here's why. And this is the kind of data that I'm looking to obtain, okay? So because of that, we've provided three handouts. The first is an example email interview protocol. This particular protocol has an example of closed-ended questions, which were demographics, and then open-ended questions as well. So the open-ended questions, I always like to start questions with, tell me about a time, describe an experience, what are your perceptions toward, why? These kind of questions that will yield really rich responses and for participants to really reflect on what they want to say. You'll also notice in that in email interview protocol, best practice, just like with face-to-face -face interviews, that the interview questions align with the research questions. You'll see everything by topic. So feel free to take that and use it as an example. Then we've included an example recruitment letter to participants. So this might be a correspondence that you have once you've obtained permission to reach out to participants. So for example, you, you might send this recruitment letter directly to participants if that's the permission you were given. You might have a gatekeeper at an organization send it on your behalf. So feel free to take that, revise it however you want to use it. It's all yours. And then lastly, the FAQs, best practices handout. There is one other thing I want to call to your attention on the FAQs best practices handout. It's not just the questions that we talked about in the last slide. There we've also provided a ton of articles all about email interviews, benefits, challenges, best practices. So if you decide to go with this methodology, when you are crafting your instrumentation or your rationale for your IRB application, pull up those articles. They're all pretty recent. Take a look at them and that will help you to develop your rationale for why you've chosen them. Also on there, we've provided a variety of recently published studies that used email interviews. So you can get into the studies, take a look at how the, the researchers recruited participants, how they gained informed consent, what their questions look like, what kind of responses they got, how they reported their data as well. Everyone, we usually in qualitative research look for themes, but everyone reports in a different way. There's kind of different styles of how you can do that. And so that should give you a, a good overview when you're considering how you want to report your own data. Again, let us know if you have questions, we're here to help. So we're gonna to transition to the very last slide, which is just a wrap up and a summary. So today we've talked about how and when email interviews can be used as an effective data collection method. We talked about the strengths and challenges and some tips to kind of overcome those challenges with email interviews. We talked very briefly about best practices because all of that is on your handout, so you can have it with you at all times for reference, which I, I don't know, I love. And then lastly, the resources and handouts that we've provided to you as examples. We hope that you can use those to be successful in your own data collection. And so with that, I will hand it back over to Danny and, and I am here to field any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Romanek Murphy. Um, yeah, got to got to say, the audience is, is keeping really busy in the background. Um, I, I I think I've been typing the entire time. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's hopefully, good. Um, if if any if any students out there have you know designed a 
human replicator, they could replicate two or three of me, that would be very helpful right now. But to answer a few of the questions that have come in from several people is that, yes, we will be sending out the slides. They will be sent out at the latest by early next week. The same goes with the recording of this presentation. And for more general qualitative, for more general web, webinars on qualitative research, if you look in the chat box, you will find a link to our our core webinars page on our site. Click there and a full list of all previous cores are there. If you have further questions, just ask, uh, we'll, we'll gladly help out. And the last point is that handouts. Handouts can also be found in the control panel. Go almost all the way down between questions and chat and you'll see the handouts there that Dr. Romanek Murphy was referring to. So. And so it's on to the questions now. Great. And um, and also, yeah. Let, at last point to me. There are a lot of a, I see a lot of Trident faculty in the audience. So if, please feel free to share your questions and experiences because it's that can that can be added to the learning opportunities here for students as well. Because I see quite a few uh, quite a few trident faculty and audience so appreciate the support so the, this first question is actually from a faculty member dr romanic murphy um how how are these separated from a qualitative questionnaire submitted by email to participants and then have member checking uh conducted see uh, they seem nearly identical uh and I don't know if that's a little unclear for you. If um, it may be in reference to a specific slide, so you can get that information if you need that. Yeah, I can speak to it. No, I can speak to it um, a little okay. bit, and I hope that's your question. But qualitative questionnaires, typically, the format that I've seen, um, they have they have more close-ended questions with maybe a follow-up. So, uh, have you had this experience? Yes, no. Tell me a little bit more about that. And they typically take a little bit less time to complete and oftentimes qualitative questionnaires are completed with like a survey monkey or something they can all be done in one setting although that's that's up to the researcher it's more in the formatting in my experience of the questions themselves so rather than doing a questionnaire which would be more yes no and then tell me a little bit more it's really asking those thoughtful thought provoking questions that are going to yield rich longer responses uh, with fewer closed-ended questions. Also with email interviews, with a qualitative questionnaire, we typically we typically recommend a larger population to have a few more because the data that we're getting isn't quite as rich with the formatting of the questions that we do provide. So we like to see a bigger sample size. With a email interview and the types of questions that we're asking, we typically like to say at least 10, but I mean, 10 to 30 would be great, but you can get a lot of rich data out of 10 participants. And so those are the primary differences. And then how you how you disperse those would be up to your discretion and how you advise your students. I hope that addresses your questions. With member checking, most often if something is vague or unclear, we advise students to reach out again to clarify, can you please talk me through, um, can you please, provide clarification on this question. I wasn't quite sure, perhaps with a phone call too, if, if that's how they've established that they're gonna communicate. And one thing that's also really nice about email interviews, and it's not member checking at, it, at its finest, but it, it's an extra added layer of credibility, is that they, the participants themselves are writing the transcripts. They're, it's transcribed for you, right? So you're not doing any transcribing. They've had the chance to reflect, kind of look things over, reread and send them to you. So they, we do have more of a, a chance for clarity overall on behalf of the participant. Does that answer your question? Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, happy to yeah. yeah, hopefully. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and just with the way the questions do come in, if there's follow up you have or it didn't quite get to where you wanted to go, just just ping us in the question box and do our best to follow up. And next question for you is what are what are the major biases associated with email interviews 
And the second part, what is the best form of tri triangulation to validate the data from the email interviews? So bias, I mean, it, the bias is so hard to avoid in qualitative research, but I think as long as we're crystal clear about the potential biases and how we're going to control for those, that's really helpful for the reader. So just like anything else, there's confirmation bias. Um, perhaps it may be confirmation bias is when you're, when you're looking for, you have a preconceived notion about something. And so it's almost like you're looking to support your confirmation, which is a really dangerous thing to do in research. We want to avoid that at all costs. There could be a sample bias that depends maybe all of your participants have experience a certain experience that are going to kind of shape their responses in a similar way towards those there could be a research bias a researcher bias maybe you've had a set of experiences that will influence your way to interpret the data or how you've selected your participants but i think just like with every qualitative study it's just so important to be reflect on these biases lay them out within your limitations talk about how you're going to address them and use the data to support your themes i just think it's so important um, I also think it's really important to do like a double code, for example, to ensure that your results are uh, credible. But you have to really, really use that rich, thick narrative data to support the themes that you're proposing. So you're not just telling the reader that, oh, this is what I found and here's why. So it's not coming from an opinion-based place. I think tying back everything back to previous literature also helps to avoid, avoid bias. And then can you tell me the second part of that question, Danny? Sure. Uh, just give me a second, uh, please, to, to pull it back up. Uh, yes, the second question is, what is the best form of triangulation to validate the data from the email interviews? Oh, I think that depends on the scope of the study and, and what you decide to do with your chair and what exactly the problem is that you're looking at. We've done a lot of document review, for example, which has been really nice to see what's available, what's out there, what are best practice, how does that compare to previous literature and the responses you're getting in your data. Observation is another one. Of course, audio video files. All the different sources that we talked about in qualitative research before, those are options, but it just totally depends on your problem and your focus. Um, but those have been some helpful things that we've done in the past, particularly document review and observation. Thank you. And next, next question uh, we have for you is that um, some, sometimes in, in an in-person interview, something may be said that prompts a follow-up question. How can we establish that as an up, or, or excuse me, can we establish upfront a possibility for follow-ups? 110%, yeah. So like I said, most of the time they're structured email interviews, but sometimes they're semi-structured and sometimes it's gonna be really important to have follow-up questions. If, if somebody leaves you with a lingering thought or something, you think, oh gosh, okay, we really need to explore that further for my study. And I think if you're just upfront with that in the recruitment letter to participants, or if you provide some instructions with your email interview protocol, um, just establish some rapport and let them know that if, if necessary, would they be comfortable with you following up with a couple of other questions? And that's totally fine. Absolutely, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. And the next question we have here is that uh, I only have about 20 interview questions. Could that suffice if they, if the questions are specific and to the point? Again, it kind of depends. I, I I haven't seen your interview protocol. Of course, your chair would have to take a look at that. 20 interview questions can be next to nothing, or they can be way too many if they're open-ended in a way that's going to capture all sorts of data and you've got a very verbose uh, um, participant. Dr. Deegan had talked about a 25-page manuscript, right? So if you're asking 20 questions and you're getting 25 pages, oh my goodness. So if you're asking closed-ended questions, though, I would probably advise you to speak with your chair and to reconsider based on the scope of your study. What is it that you really want to get to the meat to? Look at your research questions and make sure that you're asking enough open-ended questions that align with your research question, that you're going to get the rich data that you need if qualitative, if a qualitative design is feasible for your study. So it totally depends on the format of your questions, what your research question is. But just really consider what you're getting, trying to get to the meat of the, the meaning you're trying to ascribe and 
make sure you get with your chair. We've got amazing, amazing chairs at Trident with lots of knowledge and they're gonna be able to guide you through that process. But if you do have additional questions, shoot me an email or Dr. Deegan. Yeah, and to add on that, we, we have gotten a couple similar questions and just to do a general follow-up because I did follow up with this one person is that if you're asking a question like that, it was, it'd be helpful to provide a little bit of background and a type of research or your goals or or further to the points that Dr. Roman Murphy made as well, because that that could help her provide a, a better answer if that information is available. Uh, and next question for you is, how can data validity be ensured through email interviews? So I would revisit the concepts of trustworthiness and credibility. So in qualitative research, and I won't go too far into this because it's a whole different broad topic, but in qualitative research, we're not going for validity and reliability. We're going for accurate descriptions of every stage of the process. We want you to be able, if you did the study again, it would yield similar results. We want somebody to be able to look at the steps that you've outlined very, very clearly and go ahead and make do reduplicate that study because everything you outlined was so clear that they could go ahead and, and use that with another um, with another population or sample, excuse me, another sample or different demographics, however they're going to choose to use it. But my biggest advice is always when you come to your data analysis, you're typically looking and coding into themes, make sure you are backing up your themes with quotes. I think it really tells a story. That's the whole point of interviewing is that we can tell a story and make sure you're supporting that with the themes. And so just really make sure that you're letting your data drive your findings so that your study can be credible and that you've outlined every stage of the research process so that every decision you made is crystal clear and someone could take this study and do it again. I hope that makes sense. But yes, please go and review the concepts of trustworthiness and reliability and there is a great resource and maybe i'll share it with danny if i don't know if we can send it out but it's the last name is given g-i-v-e-n from 2008 so it's a little dated but that article on trustworthiness and credibility spells things out so crystal clear you'll understand so much more when you conduct your study great thank you and uh, just a couple more questions and as a reminder if you have questions you can submit them in the question box in the control panel right hand side of your screen there there are a few people we may not get to a couple of you i've already said something to uh but we will follow up after yeah, after the webinar uh, and next question if using a structured interview protocol how is this different than uh from calling this a survey it's it's not a survey it's in the format it, it's in the formatting and in the language that we use so a lot of times surveys are used most often in quantitative research and we're, we're using different data collection analysis measures for that that's a totally different approach to research but the interviews again i'll reiterate it's in the structure of the questions that we ask surveys typically will yield not data that's not quite as rich examples of surveys again are like the survey monkey and things like that when everyone is sitting down, in my experience too, when you sit down and fill out a survey, I would expect a survey to take me five to 10 minutes. I'm in, I'm out, that's my expectation. And I think it is for most people, that's the, that's the general consensus around that. Whereas with an email interview, you're expecting and asking your participants to take 30 to maybe 45 minutes of their time. It's a totally different purpose, right? What you're trying to get to is completely different to sit down, reflect, and respond back to you directly. And so I hope that that, I hope that, that kind of makes sense. There's one other caution I have, which again, it depends on the reason you're choosing this methodology or not, but with a qualitative questionnaire or a survey, oftentimes you're given you know, a, small, a small box to enter your follow-up response in to elaborate. And when you're given a small space to write in, you typically type a little bit. You just type a little bit and you fill in that box. And there's also more a propensity to report your data in a different way. So with email interviews, we often see a lot of rich thick quotes. It's a story. You're telling a story and getting really deep and meaningful. And meaningful. But with the survey, oftentimes you're going, well, 25% of participants felt that COVID impacted them in their learning experiences online immediately following the pandemic. An email interview will typically yield data like 
I felt completely lost. I felt isolated, but thankfully my teachers helped me to feel supported and so did fellow students. And you'll see more of an elaboration because the expectation is for longer, richer descriptions. And this isn't my experience, but I hope that addressed your question. Thank you. And we have, yeah, we have one more question. I really want to thank everyone for all of your questions today. And if anything comes in after this, we'll get back to you after the webinar ends. Uh, and question for you is, uh, are email interviews, um, or using email interviews and dissertations or DSPs, uh, is that opportunity available across other departments? This is coming from a DBA student. To my knowledge, yes. But what I would advise is please talk to your department heads and, and seek clarification. But it's a qualitative data collection method. Um, so I would assume yes is the answer, but please talk with your chair and, and department head just in case they have additional guidance for you. Yeah, and and, and just yeah, follow up with, with that. The, the follow up question I had to the person that asked that is to speak speak to your chair or your department head and D, DBA. That's uh, Dr. Indira Guzman. And that's that's all we have for today. So thank you, Dr. Romanik Murphy, for the present. Great presentation. Thank you for everyone for coming. We had, we had a, definitely had a full house today. You guys really kept me busy in the background. Uh, you probably can't squeeze it, see, but I'm, I'm sweating a little bit here. Um, all, all these good questions coming in. But and as a reminder, we will be sent. We will be sending out the slide deck and the recording for you uh, by early next week at the latest. And and here's that link again for our archived webinars because I know quite a few of you asked about that. We have an, a nice little collection going back four or five years of core webinars on all different uh, types of subjects uh, helpful for doctoral students. Uh, so you can, you can access all of them there. And we, our next core webinar will be in May, May 19th, I believe, and information on that one will be going up soon. And to contact today's presenters, information's up on the screen now. And as always, you know, if you need anything, please reach out. Thank you again, Dr. Romanik Murphy, for the great presentation. And wish Dr. Deegan could, could have made it today, but you know, thank you to her too for her great contributions. And have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.